you know, there's a saying in, in like strategy that like growth is not a strategy. It's not a business strategy. And I think for, for videos, like vi viral virality is not a strategy. We're all about turning a crappy situation into something about positive. A quarter million dollars of credit card I debt. I still remember the day when no one turned out. Throw it in the garbage and start from scratch. I could give myself a chance, so I started something. I mean, I think that counts as from poop to gold. <laughs> our sponsor for this episode is our 14-day video script challenge. Yes, we are sponsoring our own show. Yes, we are. <laughs> Welcome back to From Poop to Gold. I'm your co-host, Benton Crane, and I'm here today with Tom Lytle. Welcome, Tom. Thank you very much. Such a pleasure to have you here. Yeah, likewise. So Tom is the Senior Director of Social Business at Dell Technologies. That's right. Which means you are in charge of all of the social media for all of the companies that fall under the Dell Technologies brand. Yeah, or, that's or right. Brand umbrella, right? Yeah, primarily Dell, Dell EMC, and then at that brand level, Dell Technologies. That's right. Got it. And prior to this role, you spent 10 years in a similar role at EMC. Yeah, so. building up the EMC, social team EMC, for those who don't know, storage company based in Boston, it's where I'm based now. Um, so that's what we were before the merger. And then I was brought in to lead the team once uh, the companies were combined. Yeah. Fantastic. How did you arrive? What was the path? What, what did the path look like to get you where you are today? Yeah, you know, I, I don't know if anyone ever decided, or at least in, in, in my age, I don't know if anyone ever decided that they wanted to get into social media. It just sort of happened. Uh, this was right around the mid 2000s or so right. um, when I started taking interest in it. And, it, you know, I, I suspect there's a lot of folks like me where we were in general marketing jobs and we just started to like this thing that was then called Enterprise 2.0. It was and no one really knew how to define it. It was like just doing work, doing marketing in a different way that hadn't been done before. And there was a lot of, you know, web and digital involved. So um, I just said yes to everything I could and not knowing really what it was. I just knew I had fun doing it. And I think that benefited me in the end, because at a certain point, it's just like pull the kid in that just said yes to all the things <laughs> that we asked him to do. And, you know, you start to pick up a few things along the way. So that's how I got into it more more practically, though, when I was in grad school, um, I studied a lot under um, essentially the topic of creativity and innovation. And it's interesting right around that time. This was, again, mid 2000s social was starting to enter in those discussions as like this really disruptive thing that no one really understood what it was like. Wikipedia was a thing, but no one knew what to do with it then. And uh, it started to really pique my interest and I don't know, the rest is history, but love to talk about the history. So it, it caught your interest and in some ways you stumbled into it a little bit, yeah, largely right. by saying, yes, I'll, I'll try it. I'll, oh, I'll do it. Yes. Yeah. Now today, you know, fast forward to today. Yeah. Where is the passion coming from to keep going with it? That, a really simple answer is the passion is tomorrow. I don't know uh, what it's going to look like. Every day we wake up and something has changed about the world of digital and social. And very specifically, the thing that excites me right now is I think there's a world of people that are in social media jobs that have been in a, in, in a social media bubble for a, a good portion of five to eight years. And suddenly... We have to break out of that bubble and say, wait a second, we're not we're not like social marketers, we're digital marketers, and we need to play ball with the web team. We need to play ball with email. We need to somehow play a role in this like omni-channel thing that's happening. No longer can we just, you know, quote unquote, play on Facebook. I know that's not what we do, but that's the perception of a lot of social teams. So th there, there have been transformations all along the way, like every step of the way. And the new one, I think, is even more exciting than the last one that we went through. So a lot of people are intimidated by change. Sounds yeah. like you're energized by change. Yeah. So I'm guessing that you are one of those people who is kind of always on the lookout for, for what's next and, and what's changing. Um, do you have anything in your, in your sites that you're, you're finding really interesting right now? Well, for me, this goes back to taking traditional social teams and making them think outside the box. Um, it's a, it's, it's a passion and a profession of mine to do that. Right. My biggest rub with, I think any company is if you've been in a, a planning meeting in, in any marketing capacity, there's usually a strategy slide that says, Oh, for this particular campaign, here's what we're doing. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. And ultimately there's a bullet that says social on it. And then they go to the next slide <laughs> and 
so social has become like this bullet of like, yes, we're doing that thing. We're doing social. And it's so much more than that. And I think as social media professionals, as social marketers, it's our job to break out of being the bullet and actually define how social can um, drive these very, very important stories and campaigns that you know our organizations have. And you know, not just play that that bit role. Actually, play a much bigger role driving the strategy. And um, I think either that's that transformation that I'm talking about. And I'd like to say that we have a choice. We don't. Like we have everyone in a social capacity, especially at a bigger company, has to be making that change right now. Um, and the ones that do it sooner, I think, the ones that are going to succeed, obviously, a lot sooner. You know, what's interesting about that is you're coming from the perspective of a big company, right? Yeah. Dell is a massive organization and right. you're experiencing that there. But even at Harmon Brothers, where we're a tiny little agency, we've been guilty of that exact same thing. You know, in our early days, launch Squatty Potty, you know, social is a bullet on the slide, right? right? Because our strategy is all about um, creating an ad and then putting a, a, a paid media strategy behind it to to make it go. And social is just kind of like this afterthought that you just let it happen. That's right. right. And and so as time goes on, we're learning the same lesson that you are, that a distribution strategy is multifaceted, that includes paid, it includes earned, it, right. in, it includes um, the, the social strategy around it. So um, we've been guilty of the exact same thing. Right, and it, it brings me back, there's a thing we always say about video, at least in the company. It's like publishing the video to YouTube is not the end of the marketing plan. And far too often it is, especially when you're at a company with 100,000 plus employees, many of them using YouTube as a channel to get their content out there. The thought, because you know there needs to be more understanding of all these different vehicles that we have, it can get really confusing, right? But the thought is, oh, if you just publish something to YouTube, people are going to watch it, right? Because that's what you do on YouTube. Hasn't and worked for us. No, it doesn't. You always it, have to have that distribution it strategy. It really doesn't. It's just the place. It's like the holding ground. And then it's it, it's what you do with it. That's what matters most. Yeah, that, that's great. Um, okay, so when it comes to a successful social media strategy, it all comes down to storytelling, right? That's it's, right. The storytelling is at the core of, of everything. I want to hear about you and your team's creative process, both in terms of how do you generate a great story as well as how do you find a great story? Well, finding the great story is the toughest part. And I think a lot of social teams um, aren't able to source the great stories uh, the way that a PR team or a brand team is able to support. So we're really lucky at a company like Dell where we have um, a really successful brand team with great relationships with our partners. And they serve us these stories um, that are fantastic, super easy to tell um, on our channels. And I, I recognize that it can be frustrating, I think, for smaller companies that don't have, you know, um, uh, a McLaren sponsorship uh, to be able to talk about how you're transforming this, you know, uh, very prestigious F1 company. Um, so, there is still the ability, I would say, in a social team to, to tell stories even about things that may not seem so sexy in the first place. And I've seen it done left and right. I think at many brands and our team does it well. You just teased us with something. It's it, McLaren F1. That's you, right. You, let's go deeper there. Yeah, yeah. So M McLaren is um, a partner that uh, we started working with probably about a year ago, maybe a, a little bit more. and. They're basically using a suite of Dell Technologies products, and um, we are lucky enough to be able to tell the story in, in great detail and great partnership with them about how we're transforming the way that they're managing, essentially, their their team and their car. And is, that's yeah, what for, it, so for our listeners who don't know, it, you know, I'm a motorhead. Okay, McLaren is a world famous car there company, you go. right? Um, they make fantastic race cars, yes, so yes. keep going. So, but the challenge then becomes, you have something like F1, how do you tie F1 to your technology story and not make your digital channels look like you're an F1 company? And that's where the storytelling comes into play. And that's where I think you have to be very precise and purposed with how you are articulating that story in a way that makes sense to your audiences that, many of which are not 
you know, gear heads and, and maybe don't know much about F1. So that's the delicate thing that social teams, digital teams have to do, brand teams, just to make sure that it's, it's landing in the right way, in the right manner, and isn't polarizing your audience that is expecting you to be post, you know, posting technical content about storage or um, PCs or servers or what have you. Um, and, you know, that's a challenge that we like, though. We really like that. And, you know, it just comes down to, I was hearing you talk earlier today about data-driven decisions. If you're doing this stuff and you're not looking at the data, then you're never going to know what's working. And you just have to be able to um, pull all of that in, uh, process that data, and adjust whatever you're doing to make sure that it's landing the right way. That's awesome. Now, you were one of the people behind a pretty famous video, right? That's right. Tell yeah. us about that. Yeah, so good transition there from from F1. So uh, a few more years back when I was part of EMC, which was the storage company acquired by Dell, um, we had a partnership with Lotus, the Lotus F1 team. And back then we were really, really big on just coming up with weird, cheeky ways to get attention. And a lot of that was related to stunts. We did a lot of this at our events, at our launches. And uh, there was a team that did a lot of these. One gentleman in particular, Greg Gotts, um, was a mastermind behind all these things. And uh, I can't tell you the story. I wasn't in the room where it happened, so to speak. Um, but someone came up with the crazy idea about jumping a um, semi truck, uh, a, a large tractor trailer, trying to break the world record for the distance. Uh, 70 plus some feet and in the same brainstorm someone said well we have to tie all this together so why don't we just drive an f1 car under the truck <laughs> as it makes this jump and you know it's something on paper and even in a podcast i can't articulate um how amazing it is to watch the video um there's a great making of video as well that's still out there but they shot this thing um, i don't think with any um expectation that it was going to be as popular as it was and sure enough, a few things happened. We broke the world record, um, and we simultaneously terrified, you know, 60 plus million viewers when they watched this video of this tractor trailer jumping over a car. A couple interesting things happened about that uh, particular video. Uh, one, I would say, was our, our first like viral video. We didn't really know what we were going to do with it sure. once it happened. There were certainly a lot of meetings after that that started with, okay, let's make a viral video now, <laughs> uh, which doesn't necessarily, as you know, I'm sure it doesn't, doesn't really happen that way. But the other interesting thing that happened was when you look at the data, um, the, the 30 second spot that we had, which was just a real tight, punchy view into the jump was actually viewed on average about 45 seconds. So people were watching the video and they were rewinding it to watch the truck, truck awesome. jump again, just because it's so crazy to watch. Um, the key for a social or a digital team is to be able to take something like that and say, okay, if, if we have a story, let's say on our .com, where we're trying to sell products that are affiliated with this partnership, how do you bring someone from this YouTube video or all the different channels that it might be on and bring them back into the fold, back to your real estate, you know, it's, and it's like, okay, back to business here. Let's talk about storage. That's a really tough thing to do. And I think we got a lot of things right with that video. And I think we learned a lot about um, just making sure that uh, some of those avenues are paved uh, the next time we decide to do something crazy like that. And there's been certainly some other uh, stunts that we've done, but that's the one that stands out as being, you know, the one that my family knew about before uh, they understood that it was my company. So... I'm that, proud to have worked with That's so that awesome. One. I would have paid money to be on set for the filming of yes. that. That is amazing. Yes. Not in not in either of the cars, though. I don't think we would want to be in those cars. <laughs> nope. Um, so it, it's really interesting that, that you shared those takeaways from it because all of the time we have companies coming and saying, hey, can you make us a viral video? Start there. And, and so we always have to back up and say, well, hold on. You know, actually, you can't really predict virality. Yes. When it happens, it's kind of a matter of there's some luck involved with that. Sure, you got to make something interesting and fun and everything, but for it to go viral, there's luck involved That's with right. that. And and then the third piece that we always educate them on is that when something does go viral, it's actually really, really hard to capture that virality and actually make it drive business. That's right. Um, so true. That that's a really hard concept for for people to grasp. People have this idea that oh, if I could just go viral, then I will have made it, right? 
And you probably heard that in a lot of those meetings. It reminds me of like a band getting signed by a record label. Like that'll solve everything. If I get signed by a record label, I'll be, yes. So you're absolutely right. And it reminds me, there's a saying in, in like strategy that like growth is not a strategy. It's not a business strategy. And I think for, for videos, like vi viral virality is not a strategy. That's exactly at, right. At, at all. And too often, I think that's the misinterpretation of video as a medium or, or, or frankly, anything nowadays, right? Even, right, there's tweets that go viral or have nothing to do with video or imagery, but that's not that's not the strategy. So there has to be a strategy wrapped around it, or at the very least, a strategy packed around that once something happens like that. And it is incredibly hard. Yep. Makes perfect sense. What about stepping away from your role at yeah. Dell yeah. and and tell us about a situation for you personally mm -hmm. where things were bleak, things were rough, and and you persevered and came out the other side with something gold. Boy, that's funny. Uh, I, I have I've lived a very pampered uh, life in my terms, I, I, meaning you know, I've always liked what I did. Mm -hmm. um, but let me let me take it back a little bit and see if I can uncover it, if you don't mind. Sure. So I, st I you know, I was a marketing undergrad and uh, I got a job in finance at, at Accenture at a consulting uh -huh. firm. And I mean, that is a, a weird thing to begin with, how you can get into a finance job with marketing. I guess that means I was good at marketing, that I could uh, mask myself as a finance person. You were able to person. sell. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, you know, this was right around the time Sarbanes-Oxley, and for all the Sarbanes-Oxley heads on the podcast, that was right around the time that was really taken off. Now that, that's post-Enron, if I remember yeah, correctly. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So this would be in the early 2000s. Okay. You know, for me, finance just really started to get boring um, and the creativity was taken out of, it's, I know it's surprising to hear, but there was a lot of creativity in finance um, that you could approach your job, um, build your forecasts and your budgets and, and just like design these mechanisms that spit out like perfectly fine-tuned numbers. It became really hard once um, uh, gap accounting really uh, took on. So, um, I decided it was time to get out of finance. And that's when I, I went back, got my MBA, and actually focused on things that were not you know, finance related um, with a lens of creativity, as I mentioned. So there was a guy at UMass I studied under, Professor um, Alan Robinson, Dr. Robinson, who writes on corporate creativity, he has a book, a very popular book called Ideas Are Free. Um, as well as the other one called corporate creativity. And it really opened my eyes up to all the stuff that happens in an organization that I think um, can be improved. And if you just are bold enough to ask the questions about why and why not, you can actually make some very sizable uh, impact in changes in an organization. And um, that was the spirit that I brought into the role that I went into um, uh, outside of grad school and marketing and, and allowed me to fight my way up into getting into social media. It may not seem like a lot, but going from finance to something that is uh, 180 degrees in the opposite direction, that's a long, that's a, that, that's a hard pivot to make in your that, career. That's and, a scary thing. And that is, and you have to explain it along the way. Like, why in the hell are you making this shift? I remember um, going to get a marketing job after my MBA and I remember being told like, what, what are you talking about? You're a finance person, what are you talking about? And it felt like I was etched in, in stone as the finance guy, which if you don't wanna be a finance person is the most horrifying thing you've ever heard in your life. Like, I, I, it's like the movie Clerks. I, I, I wasn't even supposed to be here today. Like I wasn't supposed to be the finance person, but suddenly I had become one. So I had to fight my way back um, into something that was a little more creative and a, a little rounder and I was able to do that. I, I can 100% relate with you. I, I, at one point in my career, I was at Deloitte working in, in intelligence consulting. And the move I was about to make was to leave Deloitte, you know, a quote unquote, you know, stable, you know, career path, et cetera, et cetera. And I was leaving to go join the Harmon brothers to sell poop spray at Poopery. And I still remember walking into my manager's office to turn in my resignation and said, well, I'm, I'm here to resign today from Deloitte and I'm going to go sell poopery. <laughs> and, and she thought it was a joke. You know, she's like, yeah. you're doing what? 
And then any friends, any family that I told you're doing what? Yes. Uh, so yeah, I, I hear you like that's so scary. These are the leaps. This is the end yeah. of Indiana, Indiana Jones and the last crusade when he's stepping on the invisible, you know, the invisible shelf across that. That's what these, you know, leaps are for us professionally when we do this stuff and have no doubt in 2007, 2008, when, um, when you tell your, your manager that you're going into something called social media, no one understands it. No one, un even then no one really understood what that was. And a lot of folks didn't think that it was going to really succeed. Twitter, come on. Right. What, pictures of your brunch. Who cares about that? And what, what business application does that have? All of it. Yes. All of it. And I'm so glad that I did it. So while it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like failure to success, I would say, you know, just recognizing the the changing tides for anyone and going towards that is is something that could um, really benefit you in your career. And it's never something you want to lose sight of. For our listeners, what tip or tips would you offer to somebody who's facing a similar situation where they're at a point in their career where they're starting to recognize that they want to pivot? I would say, how many people have you heard say they're, um, they wish they hadn't pivoted? I've had that feedback given to me. I remember having to make a really tough decision once professionally. And um, I was speaking to an executive mentor and they told me, you know, I've been in these situations before. I've talked to people in these situations before dozens and dozens of times. And never once has anyone come back and said, man, I wish I hadn't made that decision. And I think it's easy to let the fear and uncertainty get in the way of opportunities. And so rarely does someone, you know, a swing and miss in a way that's uh, difficult to come back from. If anything, it just leads to more and more uh, opportunities. So that's the philosophy I try to live by. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Um, and if I could, I'd love to add one little piece Please. to that. I, I think in observing a lot of friends, I've noticed that a lot of times people get thirsty for a pivot, but because they have locked themselves into so many financial commitments, they lose the flexibility to mm. give themselves a pivot. Mm. Um, and so um, I think it's so important that as we progress through our careers, we you know live a lifestyle that's within our means so that when we do want to pursue something based on passion, we have the flexibility to, to do so. That's right, you always gotta be ready. Always got to be ready. I agree. Yeah. You never know when opportunity will knock. That's right. Um, well, Tom, I want to be respectful of your time. I know it's very valuable. Um, so I want to ask just a couple of final questions. Sure. Um, first off, um, for our listeners, where can they learn more about you? Uh, watching Seinfeld. Um, no. Uh, well, it's kind of true. Um, social media, you know, that's where, that's where I'm at. So following me on Twitter would be great. Um, or not even following me, just checking out what I'm talking about. And what's uh, your handle in, at Tom Lytle, T H O M, um, L Y T L E, or you'd find me on LinkedIn, same name. Um, and, uh, would love to connect with anyone who has ideas, thoughts about any of the things I talked about, or just want to connect. You know, we love meeting people in our, in our business. Um, okay, Tom, final question. Do you have anything that you want to plug or give a shout out to yeah so no 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 plugs i would just say you know thanks to the team that uh works for me at dell uh, they're an incredible group of folks and they're the source of essentially all the ideas uh, of the work that we do in, in social and digital um and you know this goes back to what we were talking about before being motivated um, to do something that's as crazy as social media um, when, when you have a good team of people that are really energized by the changing space, it makes it super easy. Um, and it's a lot of fun. Yeah. So thanks to those guys. So once again, Tom, thank you. Thank you. I'm all over it. Appreciate it. Make sure to like, share, subscribe, and we'll see you on the next one. As entrepreneurs and small businesses, we all kind of reach that point where we know we've created something awesome and we want to share it with the world. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's that very next step that can oftentimes be really intimidating or really scary or you just don't know where to go next right and the beautiful thing about this 14 day script challenge is you get your hand held from okay you have this cool product now let's go research and find the exact way to present it and message it to the world in a way that resonates and gets people excited and they're ready to swipe their credit card and purchase 
And in the 14 day script challenge, you get the opportunity to go through that step by step with our writers who have done it dozens and dozens of times. Yeah, you actually watch us go through each of the steps ourselves and create it with a real client, a real product, and um, it's a real campaign that's out there that's been very successful. That's right. And the feedback that we've had on this thing has just been phenomenal. I mean, we get comment after comment and emails flowing in from people all over the world who have just uh, raved about the impact that this has had on their business. People tell us over and people tell us over and over again, it is just a huge value punch for the investment for this 14 day script challenge and, and really gave them the tool set they needed to walk through it and make it happen. And we've had, um, we've had dozens of students who have successfully taken the challenge, written their script, launched their ad campaigns and driven success for their business. It's pretty amazing. For more information, go to hbros.co slash script. That's hbros.co slash script.